how many of you are from Northeast PA or, or West Southwestern Pennsylvania? Either of those areas. Where are you from? I'm from Bucks County. Bucks County. Okay, so you're, you're actually Southeast. You're with us. You're considered Southeast. But we don't have anybody up Scranton, Wilkes-Barre area, Poconos, um, anybody Pittsburgh area? Okay. Because that's what we're going to be talking about, <coughs> excuse me, this morning. I'm Ruth McDermott Levy. I am uh, faculty at the College of Nursing and I teach uh, public health nursing. So uh, nurses are interested far more than just IV bags and um, diseases. We're also interested in what prevents diseases. Um, and my research prior to this was um, really working with people um, from other countries. I um, did some work with uh, Arab women um, and uh, Arab nursing students and then also did some work with community health workers in Nicaragua. So I was mainly interested in a global perspective. Um, at the same time though, I was the uh, co-chair of Pennsylvania State Nurses Association Environmental Health Committee because my passion has always been environmental health. And during that time while I was co-chair, uh, fracking took hold in Pennsylvania, so we had to deal with it. So I was learning about these issues at the same time I was doing other research. And then it, as that research ended, um, I thought it was time to go home and really address issues that were taking place in my state. So this is a combination of some of the research that I'm doing, so I'll share some people's stories. Um, and it's also a combination of some work that I've done on the regulations that are out there because you need to understand the regulations in order to move forward with this. Is there a problem? Oh, hello over there. Yeah. Oh, oh, you know, maybe this. Off. Maybe that does it. Yeah, I don't see if that made a difference. I don't know what to do about this. No, that's light. So, okay, I'm going to, okay, see if that made a difference. All right, so there are kind of three things we're going to look at. We're going to look at what fracking is because I probably not everybody knows what it is. I'm going to do a quick fracking one-on-one. We're going to look at the health impacts because they're the regulations that I'm focusing on. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, the regulations and how um, they do not serve uh, communities at all. Um, I was at the earlier speaker this morning about Ferguson and she kept talking about um, constitutional law and how constitutional law is supposed to protect life, liberty, and property. And um, as we look at these regulations, you'll see that these don't do that. So maybe we need to go constitutional law for that. Um, I'm not a lawyer. Um, so uh, I, we're supposed to infuse Dr. King's um, philosophy, and, and this is really, th I, I'm going to share with you the pivotal moment when I said I've had enough and, and i got to speak out. And um, so um, there is a moment where you have to just say that's it. And, and that's where I am with, with all that's going on in my state. Um, we need energy. I don't know any of you that walked here this morning or didn't use a blow dryer or not you know, taking your um, iPhone off the charger. So we all depend heavily on energy. We're using it right now. Um, and so we need to think about how to use it wisely. We're counting on you engineers to do that, but please listen to us health people in that discussion. Um, you can see, you know, from the time our country began, um, we have taken off with the use of um, uh, fossil fuel energy, and we know that, that the impacts of that with climate change. So this is kind of a a very complex issue of our need for energy, but then our need to protect people. So fracking, and I'm going to just slide over to this slide, is some people will say we've done it for years. We've done it since we have d um, extracted natural gas by digging down and fracking methods since 1940. What has happened since 1990 is that the technology has changed and now we can do what's known as unconventional um, natural gas extraction using, um, using um, a, a great amount of water. So this is the old way, okay, we just go, go down a little bit. The unconventional methods are we go straight down as deep as 
80,000 feet down. We go really far down, okay? So risks of aquifers aren't that great because that's the chatter you'll hear in the news of, oh, water contamination. I'm telling you they are doing that to distract us from the real problem. So, and water is an issue, but it's not as big of an issue as air is. And so they'll, they'll go really down into the shale and then drive a lot of water. And in Pennsylvania, they use as much as 4.4 million gallons of water per well. Okay, that is not sustainable. We can't keep that up because we contaminate that water with a boatload of chemicals that are known carcinogens, known endocrine disruptors, and um, neurotoxins, okay? Our systems are not set up to clean that water and reuse it. So we now have contaminated 4.4 million gallons of water that we will never use again. And we also use sands to keep the fractures open. So they drive this down with a, do you, am I still bothering you? The sound, the, the sound from this room is actually happening in that room. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if. Can you unplug can this? Plug yeah, unplug that. Did that work? There you go. Okay, good. So I'm so sorry about that. So in addition to all the fluids and all the chemicals, there are sands that are down, sent down to use to keep the fractures open. So they, they lose a lot of um, water to break open the shale, push down at um, great force, and then sand is used to keep it open. Um, keep that in mind as we move forward. The, the challenge and what makes this also so unique from an environmental perspective is we have changed from what's known as a point source to a non-point source. Those of you um, in geology and environmental sciences, I hope you know those terms. But um, what a point source is, is when we can identify one single cause of a pollutant. So um, a couple years ago, there was uh, water contamination and a stream and the fish were dying. We tracked it back to one pharmaceutical lab that was dumping water into the stream. That's point source. With all of these many wells and, and the many fractures, because it can make from 10 to 20 fractures, and we don't know exactly where that is occurring along that line, we now have non-point source. So that becomes more diffuse. We can't identify one single polluter. So it becomes more difficult legally. It becomes more difficult to track as far as deciding what, is, what the issues are. And it is spatially intense, meaning we have now industrialized rural Pennsylvania. We have many wells very close together. And in addition to all the wells, it's all the support systems. So we've got trucks coming through. We've got um, sand um, transfer stations. We've got dehydration stations along the, the, tra the pipeline trails. And so we now, as I said, it is, we have people who have Many people who have selected to live in rural areas are now living in an industrialized area. Um, just to kind of put this in perspective, in Pe Pennsylvania, we're talking about the Marsalis Shale, it does go up into New York. If you follow this at all in the news, New York has recently um, have a moratorium on gas wells, so they will not be drilling currently. They're doing other things up there related to gas. Um, oh, my little thing isn't working. My little pointer thing isn't working. Okay, so that's up in Northeast PA. Um, another big shale play that they're, um, that's going on, so this is going on around the country, is Eagle Ford in Texas and then up in Colorado. They're um, very active um, drilling, but as you can see, it is happening around the country. Um, and they're doing some really crazy things out in California as far as um, uh, re-stimulating wells that are in um, like downtown Los Angeles. Um, so they, they're doing some wild things. So let me just grab my tea. I don't, oh, there it is. Okay, so once we have injected the, um, the wells, we get flow back of water, and from 15 to 85% of the water comes back. So the, the fracked water comes back. And so they need to do something with that, and what they tend to do is put it in um, these ponds for it to evaporate a bit, okay? Because then it's less waste they need to deal with. And, and then take it to a treatment center in some way. What um, they, in some communities, they were putting it back in the municipal 
um, water system, and they found out that was not a good idea because, as I said, they could not manage that. They um, are also doing deep well injection, and so you're probably hearing about um, little earthquakes in Ohio that was just recently made the news. That's been going on for a while, um, and that's from injecting the water deep into the earth, never to be used again. We've never done that before taken millions of gallons of water to never be used again. Water is a really important commodity, so it's probably not a good idea. Um, so that's kind of the, the water, um, the quick thing of, of the water. Some of those pits can um, leak. They've gotten better about that and making safer pits. They're also doing this in, um, they're doing this around the world. In Australia, their pits aren't even lined. So um, they've got bigger regulatory problems than we have. Um, you can see this is what a uh, well site looks like. You can also see up in the corner, so there's your, your pit, your waste pit, but you can see up in the corner, those buildings, there's people's homes, okay? So we've got evaporating chemicals 24 hours a day while they're sleeping, okay, in these pits. And also while they're working the wells, um, they're breathing those gases that are coming off 24 hours a day. So that leads us to the risk of the air. There is a problem. What they're collecting is methane gas. Um, and so there is a, a big problem with methane leaks. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those regulations and how that's changing. Um, so that's a problem. Methane is a really potent greenhouse gas, so that we don't really want the, that leaking. We also have um, the mix of the chemicals from fracking, um, which are aromatic hydrocarbons. And they are. Um, known to cause leukemia in children. Um, if you do follow this at all, people who complain of nosebleeds and, and a funny taste in their mouth, that's what they're being exposed to. Okay? So it does interfere with the bleeding system and our ability to clot blood. So we don't really want to be exposed to that. Um, also, because of this industrialization, we have um, increases in ground level ozone, which can cause um, respiratory problems, even in healthy adults. So people who have typically have, um, uh, may have chronic lung disease or cardiac disease, they're at risk, but you know, I'm assuming most of us in here don't have those problems, and so we're at risk also from exposure to that. And then particulate matter, which is small little particles in the air, and that increases people's risk of heart attacks and strokes and high blood pressure. Okay? These are things you've all heard about. So in the United States, we're already at risk for that, and we're increasing the risk. And there's a study coming out from University of Pennsylvania about people um, with increased hospitalizations in when, when the, frac when the um, wells are being stimulated. We also have kind of a, a social um, change in, in um, the social um, norms of communities. So again, these are rural communities. You know, not many people are driving around on these back roads, typically. But that is not an uncommon scene to see, is tanker truck after tanker truck um, going down country roads. And it is 24 hours a day. So, so that interferes with people's ability to sleep because they're used to the quiet. And there, is, there are health impacts of noise. Noise also can increase blood pressure and cause <coughs> problems. So we can't dismiss that stuff. Um, and then we also can get what's known as a boom and bust economy. When things are going really well, um, you know, we have increases in people using hotels and, and restaurants. And then when, when, um, when they're all done with their work and, and or if the economy right now, they're, they're not fracking as much in Northeast PA. So things kind of dry up. And then suddenly, when people are used to a stronger economy, it just crashes. So that's stuff that we need to work with communities on how to manage that. And we also are seeing increases in rents because more people are coming in. When, when, during the boom cycle, more people are coming in. So people are displaced who had never been before. So rent suddenly went from $300 a month to $1,300 a month. And so the people who are most vulnerable, the elderly, the disabled, and the poor get um, shuttered out of, of um, you know, Opportunity. So there's a lot of sofa surfing that goes on and all those sort of things. So kind of unstable housing situations. We can't forget about the workers. These are people just doing their job. And it's a good opportunity. They're making good money. But they're exposed to these chemicals all day long. So there's occupational health risks that we need to think about. 
There also, when you dig really deep into the earth, there is naturally occurring radiation, okay? So when they pull up the equipment, it can be radioactive. So we need to work, make sure that the appropriate equi um, uh, preventive um, equipment is available to them. When I was talking about that sand that they use, the, the propellant to keep those, the fractures open, that's, that's it, that spray. It's called silica. And, it, and, it, and it's really tiny. And so people who are exposed to it, people who work with rock um, are, and you know, that, kind of, that kind of career are exposed to those really fine, fine particles of sand and they're breathing it in. Now, this picture kind of looks like he's on the telephone, so I know he doesn't have a breathing apparatus on, okay? So he's standing there breathing that stuff in, and there's a very high rate of silicosis among um, workers in, um, in the oil and gas industry, and it, that is a chronic lung disease. Um, there are also risk of injury, if you can imagine um, the equipment. Motor vehicle injury is the biggest problem, and the other thing is, for the most part, these are young 18 to 30 year old males um, not living with their families, making really good money. So what's happening on the off work hours? Okay, they're getting busy. They work hard and they play hard. So there's increase in alcohol and drug use in these communities and also increase in sexually transmitted um, infections. What has not made the um, the literature, but I do talk to people um, up in these communities where I'm doing my research. And there's a term now called frack babies of uh, young women who are uh, um, become pregnant from these relationships, and then the men move on, and you know they've they've got a child. So, so they're the social things that we need to worry about and deal with. And then lastly, um, and this is the one that makes me really wild, um, is the studies are now coming out, and, and there are risks to the developing fetus. Um, there's two um, reports that have been out, and there are more coming, um, and it's related to proximity, maternal proximity to the well. So mothers who are live within a mile and a half of the well are giving birth to babies, a higher incidence of birth to babies with congenital heart defects and neural tube defects. Um, so their, their, the structure of their heart is not um, as we would like it to be. It's not normal. And the neural tube, um, which runs down the spine, which can influence a child's ability to walk properly, um, that may not develop. Okay, so that's the one study found that. And then the other study found that children were born with lower birth weight and lower APGAR scores. Low birth weight is tied to um, intellectual capacity later. And APGAR scores also is an indication of how well the child is breathing, how well they're moving. So again, that can be an indi early indication of there are some developmental issues here. That, I mean, we should all be outraged by that. But that um, is very expensive. I mean, if we're going to just think of dollars and cents, if we are having a population that is, is not as um, cognitively intact as our Villanova students, we have a population that is going to be dependent and can't earn a living or can't earn as much as you guys all are, are hope to make. So that is a problem. Okay, we're going to have to support them. Okay? We don't want to do that. We want people who can work to their fullest capacity because we, people are, our constitution is we're, they're, they're, um, they're supposed to have, you know, a good life, right? Well, let's look at their whole life, not just being able to breathe in and out. The other things, the, and I mentioned the other risks, okay? So the chemicals and um, air contaminants. And also to point out, the Hill study, um, this, these effects were not related to water. Okay, so we can assume it is related to air, and we've been saying that for a very long time. It's the air. The air is a problem, and the, the people in the community will tell you that. But until we get, we can um, report it in the studies. Um, not many people pay attention, but that was one of the early ones that finally is saying it. So now we're going to go through time and go back, I guess, 15 years or so, and, and think about kind of what was going on. And so in 2001, <coughs> We had um, the World uh, Trade Center and, and all the other um, terrorist attacks on September 11th, and it was certainly a cause for pause. 
But our energy um, people in DC started worrying about our relationship with the Middle East and where are we going to get um, our oil and, and things to keep our country running. And so they started you know, this discussion of how can we be energy independent. And then in 2003, and you guys were probably too young. Do you remember the blackout in New York City? Anybody remember that? OK, some of you do. OK, I remember. I was on vacation with my kids, too. We were, but anyway, and they, I'm sure they don't remember it, because my kids are your age. But, but anyway, in 2003, um, New York City, there was a blackout. And it disrupted the whole grid. And everybody got very anxious. And it really showed us how unstable our grid was. And so, again, you know, Washington's getting nervous. They're like, wait a minute, we need to look at this. And then climate change started, people started finally talking about it. They're talking about it more seriously now. But at that time, people were saying, we need to start looking at this too. So those kind of three things, along with other things, but these are the big ones, started making our legislators and many other people saying, we need to look at alternatives. And so in 2005, they came up with the... Um, Energy Protection Act, which ironically has the initials EPA. And it was intended to um, promote environmental sustainability and reduce greenhouse gases. But it also, because our, our lobbyists and our um, oil and gas lobbyists, I think, are expert, um, there was included subsidies for fossil fuels, which I, it's hard to say that with a straight face for something that's supposed to um, promote environmental sustainability. But it did include subsidies for fossil fuels and also renewable energy and, and things you know, to get people to convert to um, renewable energies. But what it also did, and this is the public health um, outrage, the public health community, is there was a succession in this law that specifically exempted the oil and gas industry from any responsibility as the chemicals were injected into the ground. Okay. Um, and it's known as the Halliburton loophole. I don't know, has anybody heard that before? Okay, some people. And, and I actually spent months researching this and trying to find a political, like trying to find something that was balanced and not going to point the finger at Halliburton, and there's nothing in the literature that does not point the finger at Halliburton, or I couldn't find it. If you find it, please let me know. But um, the reason it's called the Halliburton loophole is because at the time, Dick Cheney, our vice president, was the chair of this committee. And he was also uh, the CEO of, of Halliburton or, and uh, prior to um, his services as the um, vice president. And Halliburton is the company that de developed the fracking, the, the patent for fracking. So they're the ones that developed how we frack now. And so somehow this was um, exempt from legislation. So the problem with that is, as we said, we're putting these chemicals into the ground. And so typically when companies do that, they, they're responsible for it. And we have these other laws that, that the um, environmental, the Energy Policy Act kind of overrode. So that we have the Clean Act, Water Act and National Pollutant Discharge um, Elimination Systems um, permitting, and that's under the Clean Water Act. And what that does is it requires um, uh, companies that are on properties over an acre, and we just saw what those fracking fields look like, so that's over an acre, um, to get permitting for non contaminated runoff. And you think, well, if it's not contaminated, why do they need permitting? Well, that's to ensure that it isn't contaminated. Okay, So we need to permit anything that's going to run off into our streams and lakes. And so because we don't want to kill the fish. And we also, many of us, drink um, surface water. So we don't want to do that. You know, We don't want to cause health problems. So that was one thing that was exempt from. The other thing is resource, the RICRA Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. This is um, kind of the cradle-to-grave approach to chemicals. So um, a, a corporation is responsible from the time it, it takes the chemical in, in into its possession until final disposition into the ground. Oil and gas exempt. Um, and then the Cre Clean Drinking Water Act, and under that is the Underground Injection Control Program. So you, can inject, you just can't randomly inject things into the ground. Again, oil and gas exempt. I mean, and, and and finally, and this one is um, personally, I think, the most outrageous, we have um, what's known as the Energy Planning and Community Right to Know Act. 
And this um, came out um, in 1986 after the Bhopal, India. I don't know if you've ever heard of that Union Carbide in Bhopal, India. Um, there was a, a chemical leak and 15,000 people died immediately from the chemical leak. And so um, they, we all looked at that and said, well, we can't do this anymore. So communities have the right to know what chemicals are in their communities and what is being put into the ground and the air and all those things. Oil and gas exempt because the fracking solution is considered proprietary. So it's considered a special recipe that can only be used, you know, by them. And if, if, if I share what I'm using with, with everybody, then some other corporation will use it. We do know, have a sense of what's being used, but the exact concentration we don't know, which is a problem from a toxicological perspective. So, so that's, um, that's the policies that our fracking communities are living within. So in 2008, um, fracking came to Pennsylvania and, that, and came in a big way under that legislation, under the US legislation, because there was nothing in Pennsylvania at the time. So, so what happened was, in, in the communities, they're, they're called landmen, that will come to people's stores or call them and get people to sign leases about on, for, to lease their land to, um, to drill for oil, excuse me, drill for gas. And, and so some people were wise enough to get attorneys, except for the attorneys in this region, you know, it's not like they're down in Texas where they're used to that all the time, really didn't understand, didn't understand the process and didn't understand the law. So early leases are kind of not in the best favor of um, the residents. And included in that were many what's known as gag orders, where the residents were not allowed to talk about what was going on in their property. If they did file suit and had any kind of um, agreement with, you know, if, if they could get anything, like uh, you may have heard about people getting water sent to their homes, um, if their water was contaminated at all, they couldn't then talk about what was happening. So people, you know, so that has also has limited um, kind of sharing what's going on. So again, it started big in 2008, and our governor looked around and said, well, maybe we should do something. So finally, in 2011, Okay, so this is after you know many wells have been drilled and people are living with this. Um, we have the Governor's Marcellus Shale Advisory Commission um, in Pennsylvania, and the big points from a public health perspective of this advisory commission was to develop a health registry and establish a system of timely and thorough investigation of complaints, which is really important. People complain about something; we need to double check what's going on. Just to back up, a health registry. What that is is kind of like a scorecard in a sense. People call in and say, I'm having this problem, and, and then they mark down, you know, at this particular address, people had headaches and nosebleeds and that, all those sort of things. But what we want to tie that into is, what is the exposure? Was it, you know, was the air, was it, what were the chemicals they were exposed to? Again, our hands are kind of tied. It's proprietary. So it's very difficult to really have a, an accurate registry if we can't determine just exposure. Okay, so they, so they need to follow up on complaints. They need to educate health providers and they need to educate the public. These two last things, um, first of all, none of this was ever done, okay? They, this was never done, 2011. Okay, so four years ago, this has been sitting around. They spent money on this, and they never did anything on it, mainly because they don't have money to do it. Okay, they, they didn't have any money behind it to do all these things. The lower two things, um, there are organizations that are going out working with health providers to teach them what to look for, and, and, um, and I, I've done some of that, educating health providers on what things to look for. And then we also need to educate the public, too. So... That was in 2011. In 2012, we have what's known as Act 13, and that is um, one of the most comprehensive um, laws with, for oil and gas industry in the state. And it spells out where everything is supposed to be, how far the well needs to be set back from um, streams and, and drinking water and, um, and all of those things. It didn't necessarily follow all of the governor's recommendations. They, their recommendations were pretty good. Uh, but included in Act 13, and again, I'm coming from a public health perspective, was 
sometimes called the physician's gag order or the healthcare gag order. And what that is, is if someone comes into the emergency room or a physician's office and has an exposure, <coughs> the, the, the healthcare provider, so the nurse practitioner or the physician can call the, the gas company. So they need to find out who, you know, who's your ga drilling company, what's the number of the well, get all that information while they may be gasping for breath or whatever. They can find out what is going on, like what are, what are the contaminants, and then treat those contaminants, okay? Treat the patient for the contaminants. They are not allowed to share that with their colleagues. Like they can share that for the people who are taking care of So suppose this, this young man working in the oil fields or gas fields had an exposure. I can share it with all the people that are caring for him, but I cannot share it with anybody else, okay? How do you think I know how to take care of somebody with diabetes? What's that? Like from, other people's from other patients, okay? I don't come to everybody as a new patient. I really, you know, none of us do, okay? They tell me they have a health condition. I know what to look for, okay? I know if somebody comes in with signs of chest pain, what to do. There's kind of a protocol. If I'm treating everybody as it's Groundhog's Day, every day is a new day, I'm not learning. I'm not prepared when they come in. I can't look up those drugs because, I mean, those um, chemicals. I, and, and I can't share with my colleagues. So we're not learning from one another. What are the consequences of sharing that information? Would you get fired? Well, thank you for asking that question. The question was, what are the consequences of sharing that information? It hasn't been tested. So, and we're all sitting here waiting for the case to be tested. We're waiting for it to go to court. And, and as a health professional, we're all scared to death. <coughs> it's the truth. Because, like, you know what? I, I, I'm not in clinical. I do a little bit of clinical, but not near as much as, you know, some of my colleagues do. We don't have time for that. I mean, and, and also it could tie us up. You know, we're not going to get paid. We're not going to. So, so we're walking a really fine line. But that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for the case to be tested. Because the attorneys that have read it have said, you're right, we can't talk about it. But then the, the um, oil and gas people say, that's not true. And it, and, but it, I've read it several times. I can't share it with anybody. Okay? It is proprietary. I cannot share it with anybody. Uh, how does that go against freedom of speech? <laughs> um, how, how is it not freedom of speech? Um, well, you know, in, in healthcare, we... Um, there's an issue of patient confidentiality, so we're used to not sharing things. Um, but it, um, so that, you know, that's not a big deal. Like, I would never talk about another patient to somebody or, you know, unless <coughs> it's learning, but I would never share their identity, yeah, okay? Yeah. So, so, you know, it's kind of that respect, it's okay. Uh, you know, we're kind of used to that, but the, the fact that we, it, it really just, flies in the face of the way healthcare is practiced. We consistently rely on the evidence. I mean, it is really a science. And so if we can't share or learn from, from these things, we're in trouble. We're really, and, and who's in trouble is, is the, the community. I mean, so it's the health worker. And I mean, it's the um, oil worker, or it's the you know, mother that comes in with the child that has this strange rash and is bleeding. That's who's in trouble, okay? Is the patient allowed to know what exactly they were? Yes, okay. but they have to sign that they won't share. Everybody has to sign. So and, and also, let me just add, I don't probably, well, you may have been in an emergency room before, um, you know, bumps and bruises. Things are moving quick. Things, you know, and especially if somebody has a tough time breathing or whatever, things are moving really fast. I don't really have time to call some clown in an in a office and say, can you tell me those chemicals? Can you fax it to me? So, so it, it really, it's a delay in care. There's a lot of problems with it. Now, if the patient would have the same, like, symptoms a couple years down the road, are they allowed to say to that health care provider? Um, that, we haven't even taken it that far, but okay. the, I would think that would be in the record. So, and especially now with electronic medical records, we should be able to pull that up. Okay. But that's a really good question. We haven't taken it that far. So the patient is not allowed to share with other members of their community? Mm-mm. Mm -mm. They're not allowed to share. That's a great question. They're not allowed to share with other members of their community. 
So they, so people don't know what to look for. People don't, you know, yeah. Specifically for this case, is that just because it's related to patent law? Yeah, it's it's because it's it is proprietary. There have been other things that are, you know um, sometimes the the mix of um, pesticides and stuff you know like raid or whatever can be proprietary. But we've got it on the label of what it is. This is made an other an extra an extra layer. In addition, we it is as I said it's diffuse. It's non point source. So so there can be things. You know, people may not even know there's a well near them, because sometimes that's the case, too. People may not know two miles away they're drilling. And then they start experiencing these symptoms. So if a patient were to share, like, what the chemicals that it affected them, what would happen? What they, would they, could, them they could, right, they could get in trouble. I, I, it, that, again, hasn't been tested. None of it's been tested yet. But that's, that's what the law is in Pennsylvania. And we've been fighting it since... Is 2014. It like that in other states too? Yes, yes. Actually, North Carolina um, just came out with a regulation that is even more strict. That it it will not like the uh, fracking formula is proprietary and it is against the law to share it. Period. Done. So it depends on the state. How did New York get to the point where they said that's it? I mean, yeah, I'm, it's. I'm, I'm, I guess a couple things. Like I'm, I'm originally from California, so you know, drought is huge, and I've been listening to the news yeah. over the well, last year really about the, the so, issues of water. Yeah, so I've been worried about this. So New York has done some very innovative things. Instead of using water, they're using acid and burning through the ground in a place with seismic activity. Mm -hmm. So that's what they're doing a lot. They're doing they're doing lower so um, still kind of lower gas, but yes in a, way. in a different way, gas and oil, and yeah in a different way. They're using water, but not near as much because of those issues. They're really, the um, activists are really working on Jerry Brown to, to have a moratorium, and they're counting on Cuomo coming out and doing that. Um, so in New York, it's really interesting that, um, you know, the two states are so close together and geologically fairly similar, but culturally so different. Um, Pennsylvania, um, I hate that I'm on film for this. Pennsylvania, it is, um, the culture is a little more complacent. It, it, people don't feel as empowered. Um, and, and the people in New York um, got a lot of, um, you know, there were a lot of celebrities. So they, there was money there. And they were very empowered and did some really innovative things. They came out with a whole compendium on health impacts that actually I refer to um, because it's all the science is there. So they used the science and, and, and that was Governor Cuomo's comment was he didn't want to risk public health. So he got health up there in front. I mean, it's surprising to me because I think about the same thing in terms of California. A lot of power, a lot of money, right. a lot of you know, environmental activism. Right. So Yeah, New York is. New York is, and so now they're out in California working with them. They are. They are. <laughs> they actually, they, yeah. Um, so, so, so anyway, so that's, that's what, um, that's the big issue with um, Act 13, and, and, you know, people in Pennsylvania will refer to Act 13, and everybody knows what they're talking about. So, so this summer, and this is, this was the moment where I said, I'm done, I've had enough. And even my husband stood out of my way because usually he's like, you know, you have kids, you have a family. Um, uh, in in um, June 19th, <laughs> um, Katie Culinary, and she deserves a lot of credit for this, is a, a young um, reporter <laughs> from um, WHYY. And there's this section in WHYY called State Impact, and it's looking at the impact of um, gas drilling in Pennsylvania. And it's a great resource. But she finally finally made the news, we were all aware of it, that the Department of Health in Pennsylvania was knowingly not addressing health complaints. So you would call up the state and say, I have, you know, they're drilling near me and I've been getting headaches and my kids can't sleep and, you know, uh, we have rashes. And they would either send them over the DEP and keep sending them back and forth, the Department of Environmental Protection, or they'd say, we get back to you and never get back to you. Or they somehow obstructed people reporting. Now, you remember that in 2011, the governor's report said we need a registry. But there was a directive from 
the Department of Health, because first they denied it and then they said, then it came out, the emails came out, that the Department of Health s had buzzwords that if people called with these things, they were supposed to be sent to one particular office and it was never followed up on those things. And I can tell you, I called five times in uh, 2012 because I was writing an article and I wanted to get, find out who do people call. I called five times. They never, and I was very clear, and this is what I'm calling for, this is, never ever return my call. I'm a nurse, I wouldn't never return my call. So, so it, so, what, um, that actually is outrageous, that they're charged with protecting the health of the state. Um, so I, we're not sure what's going to happen, but we, as of now we have a new um, secretary of the Department of Health, and she is a nurse. Um, as of Tuesday, we have a new, se new secretary. Um, and so hopefully um, things will change and, and that they will be more transparent and address those issues. But um, that, I, I can't even find words for that. That's just really awful. Those of us who have been working on this for a while knew about this, and, and I actually contacted the New York Times because I knew in Pennsylvania nothing would happen. Um, and, and, and then, you know, I'm waiting and waiting and nothing. I mean, like uh, two years ago I contacted them, but it finally made the news. And what it took, you know, because I knew they wouldn't listen to us, and we all knew it. We all knew they were doing this. Um, so, but it took somebody, two people from the inside, two people who, as they retired, said, oh, and by the way, this is what's going on. So, um, and people could say, well, they're leaving and, you know, you could do whatever you want. But they, you know, they, they could have, this could interfere with their pension. So they did take a risk. Um, and I don't really care. I, I'm glad it's out there and now we can address it. Um, so, so that's kind of where we are. Oh, and then uh, there is, there are some, there is some federal legislation that's trying to go through, um, introduced by Senator Casey, who is our senator. And um, Diana G D. Gillette, I guess, from um, Colorado, again, two big fracking states, are trying to um, uh, have um, full disclosure of fracking fluids. Um, it has not made it out of committee. That was last year. It's, it's going nowhere with our current um, Congress. It's not going to go anywhere. And then to throw more salt in the wound, um, our dear friends at Susan G. Komen, which is the organization for breast cancer, um, at this October Breast Cancer Awareness Month, painted fracking bits pink to, for breast cancer awareness. And, and um, because, or they didn't do it, um, they took $100,000 from Baker Hughes. Um, and in honor of that, Baker Hughes, which is the chemical company that makes the, the fracking solution, um, they painted, they had build, drill bits painted pink. And remember I said these solutions are hormone disruptors. And so among the things that um, hormone disruptors do is they cause um, reproductive cancer. So this, these are culprits in breast cancer. Um, so there's something kind of sick about that. So, um, uh, and that's, uh, and then the final piece of regulation is actually this happened last week on Wednesday. The White House um, is proposing um, EPA regulations to um, reduce methane leaks and methane emissions from um, new and revised wells. So the existing wells, it's not going to do anything, but the um, new and existing wells, there will be um, uh, better um, reduction and better monitoring of, of methane, um, which is a step in the right direction. It's pr you know, again, this is how many years later? Seven years in Pennsylvania this has been going on. Um, we're at like 7,000 active wells in the state. The plan is to eventually have 60,000 in the state. I think they're going to be putting them in closets because I don't know where they're going to put anymore. But that is um, the plan. Um, and then, <laughs> finally, uh, the, this is actually a billboard that I took in South Africa in 2009, a picture. Um, and just to remind us that um, this is an issue all over the world, that um, addictions hurting our planet energy addicts join the road to recovery because really that's what this is about is, is the bigger picture is um, our use of fossil fuel and not being able to kind of think in a better way. So any questions or comments? Um, obviously with all of the health problems and things that fracking causes and 
how we do need to move away from using foreign oil and things for energy. What is uh, your thought or suggestion on how to move forward? Um, is it more of doing this in a safer, more healthy well, way? Or okay, let me first say I am not an engineer. I'm not a climate scientist. So, I, I think, I, but I think we're smart people. I think we're really smart and we're really innovative. So I think we could do it more safely than we've been gone in there like cowboys so we could do it a lot more safely. Um, so that would be number one because we've already, the horse is out of the barn. In Pennsylvania, it's not going anywhere. Fracking is here. So, so we need to be safe. And then uh, this, is, and also this is a distractor. I mean, renewables can be effective and are effective in other parts of the world. And so if we can, you know, work with them and, and get moving with those. Any of our engineering um, colleagues have a comment about that? No? Okay. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> The last thing I guess I want to say is, is these regulations have rendered communities powerless, and it is heartbreaking. It is, it, you know, these are our neighbors. Yeah. What do you, what do you see as the, the long-term effects? I mean, I mean, thinking with that projected growth in wells and then the health effects that you talked about, you know, it's obviously it's affecting a lot of rural communities now. But right. I mean, I think it's only a matter of time before it's affecting well, really populated well, areas. Well, well. Yeah, well, you know, it, it is It is not just Northeast PA, and it's not just Southwest PA. I live in Chester County. We have three pipelines coming through. So with that means there's compression stations, and, you know, there's all kinds of other stuff that comes with pipelines. Every 100 miles, they need a compression station. They need so, and, and that is, you know, your ground shakes, and it, so... And you know, there, then there's risks of leaks that just happened in Montana. There's risks of explosions. You know, none of this is without risk. So uh, that's kind of what I'm trying to do is, is let people know this is not a problem for those other people. This is all of our problems. And so, and again, how can we do it safely and how can we best advocate for communities? Because what they do is they come in and if you don't agree to the pipeline, they condemn your land. So there's not a lot of choice. There's, you know, I, I spent my summer up in Northeast PA and I had a hard time remembering I was in the United States because people have lost their voice. They, their regulations have limited people's voices. It's heartbreaking. Um, how can people's land and property be taken at the like eminent domain which takes, could take up to years? They, they expedite it. They come through. They're coming through. You're, and, and sometimes the rhetoric is you're doing this for your country, you're being patriotic. Um, well, then run it through the White House, you know what I mean? Like, then let, let me see how patriotic you are. Like, I, I it's just, it, it's people who are rendered powerless. Can I do that to people who have paid in their mortgage full for their house? I believe they can, yes. Yes, because it's for the greater good of the community, so yes, they can condemn your land and take it and, and run it through. And then it gets into a whole thing of then your property is no longer, there was a New York Times article that then your property is no longer residential, it becomes industrial, and then your home insurance changes. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of a nightmare. Um, do you have any personal stories that stuck out to you from this summer? Um, yeah, I get the, the one... Um, uh, the one that stands out the most, I mean, there's a lot of um, amazing people. Um, and people who have, have signed lease, leases and we have wells on their property. Um, and so that's, that is an issue of me kind of making sure they understand. I, I'm, I really don't come in anti-fracking. I'm pro-health. I'm there to help their health. So, so um, but this one woman who was... Um, they were going to put a, a silica plant in her community, all that sand, a silica transfer station. So they, you know, bring the silica in and, and, um, and it's, it's the county seat, so it's a populated community. And they're going to place it near a school. Um, and remember, we saw all that dust. And so um, she got very concerned and, and spoke out. And she had asthma. And so, she, you know, and I kept telling her, you know, you need to worry about yourself, too. But she's like, no, I'm very worried about the children. I'm not worried about me. But then she said to me later, she said, you know, I 
am not an activist. I have never been political. I've never been to a, you know, a, a board county um, commissioner's meeting, never done any of that stuff. You know, I have my little shop here, I'm happy. She said, but that was it. That was the line where I said, that's enough. And kind of like, you know, the, for me, the WHYY story breaking, that was it. And that, you know, and so I met a lot of people like that. It just, okay, you've pushed me too far now. So, um, but yeah, e I mean, even the kind of pro fracking people, you know, if you want to be pro or, you know, or con with fracking, because I'm there for the community, so I don't, you know, I talk to everybody, I don't, but um, once they let their barriers down, they'll say, yeah, you know, I, I know when they're drilling over there, because, you know, we are, I get rashes, I get headaches, I, so, uh, you know, once, so, so those are the things we need to address. And, and one of the problems, and I'm a health person, <laughs> is in our regulations, and this is un unique, like in Europe it's not like this, we don't include health in our decision making. Like there's never anybody with public health background that is sitting there saying we need to do that. In, in Colorado they did what's known as a health impact study to, to see what is the health effects of the drilling industry. And they came up with all of these things. We just said, well, wow, this is an opportunity to make some money. Let's improve the economy. Well, it, the economy doesn't do us any good if we're gasping for air or di dead of cancer in five years. So, so we really need to think more broadly. Um, and once I deal with this issue, that's going to be my next thing is get, get that as a normal thing. That, you know, for that, what is it, the, what did I say, life, property, and what was the Constitution? Life, liberty, and property. Well, life is a healthy life. So we need to think about that. Anyway, so thank you all very much. Have a great afternoon.